I'm Walter Isaacson, the uh, president of the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute has always been dedicated to leadership based on values. Sometimes that seems like a bit of a cliche, but if you want to understand what it means, it's sort of what we learn by playing sports in school. It's the fact that you're part of something larger than yourself. You're supposed to collaborate. You're supposed to have certain values in the way you compete. I think in some ways we've lost that a little bit as a society, and that's Tom Ferry's role on this world today, which is by leading the sports and society program at the Aspen Institute, he's going to reinstitute that great notion <laughs> of what sport, the relationship between sports and society. Before we begin, I'm going to give a shout out to my classmate, uh, who I just was in Aspen with, Tom McMillan. And, uh, you know, this is a very complicated subject we've been dealing with, especially when it comes to college sports, something that Tom is in the thick of now with his uh, Athletic Directors Association. But um, I really do think, he and I have talked about it both a month ago when we were together and just a minute or two ago, that it's a type of thing that you were involved with the Presidential Commission on the U.S. Olympics many years ago. I hope that the next administration will make a priority, Tom, of creating a presidential commission that helps sort through some of the issues of college athletics, the financials of college athletics, how the leagues and all work, and I hope if that happens, you'll be on it again. But it's good to see you again, Tom. And our special uh, uh, speaker and guest tonight, Mark Emmert. He's probably better known, besides for running the NCAA, as being an alumna and an alumnus and president of the University of Washington. But there's some of us who remember his, him as the chancellor of LSU, yeah. a great chancellor of LSU. Because we won a football championship, that's the only reason. Yeah, you definitely won a football <laughs> championship. And that's something I, I had lunch with him today, and we were talking about many of these issues that we raise on Project Play. But um, uh, I did not tell him that I come from a Tulane family, my parents and all four of my this. grandparents. But you know, you've risen above it. I know, I know. Well, that's because I couldn't get into Tulane. <laughs> but I uh, do remember as a young child driving up to Tiger Stadium and watching Tulane get beat 63 nothing. I think, like three years in a row. So uh, <laughs> LSU could use you back, by the way, this past <laughs> Saturday. But since we're being live streamed, I won't say any more about the LSU <laughs> football program at the moment. Anyway, uh, before I get in trouble, let me turn it over to Tom. I think in 2011, Tom, we started the Sports and Society mm -hmm. program. Uh, Tom has uh, award women, uh, winning, I think, two Grammy Awards when you were at ESPN. Grammy? You think my voice is no, that good? No, no voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Emmys. Uh, Oscars, I think it was. Academy Awards for acting. Keep going. Yeah. When he was at ESPN. An award-winning journalist, but somebody who also understands the values at the core of the relationship between sports and society. So thank you all. And, and thank you, Walter. That's terrific. And thank you, Mark, for coming to this event. I've known Mark for a while. I've interviewed him in a dis different capacity with my ESPN hat on. He's been on the hot seat before, and he's still coming back to take questions from me. Sure. So I appreciate it, Mark. Um, I want to take a step back here and, and ask you uh, a classic Aspen Institute question. Walter, talk about what the, Aspen, what the Institute is all about is uh, values-based leadership, right? So to you, I mean, you've been around for a long time. You've seen a lot of great leaders. You have uh, a concept of what makes sense to you. What does values-based leadership uh, mean to you, and, and, and what are those values that are, that are core to, to you as a, as a yeah. chief executive? Well, first of all, it, you know, the, the, the whole fundamental notion of values-based leadership means that as you're thinking about and managing issues, dilemmas, it's, this is a great presidential campaign, I think, to have those kind of conversations and as you you establish for yourself personally and for your organization the values that are central to being successful in that enterprise and then you you weigh all of the decisions that you have to make relative to those values and you and you try to stay consistent to them and there's often conflicts right there's often um, issues or questions that want to drag you in one direction or another that may be more expedient to go that way or this way and less painful to go that way or this way. But then you got to stop and say, yeah, but wait a minute, that's not who we are and what we stand for. That's not who I am and what I stand for. So 
for, for us in the NCA, this is a nice segue, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, when, we, when we stop and look at issues inside the NCA, I, I, I have this very simple three-part test, and that is, first and foremost, we need to be focused on whether or not what we're doing is advancing students' academic success. Uh, there is a tiny, tiny fraction, less than 1% of the total student population. There's about 470,000 student athletes now. Some tiny fraction will become a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. The rest of them are all doing this as part of their educational experience. And if, and if we're not helping them be successful academically, mm -hmm. that's the piece that's going to transform their lives. Well, then we're, we're not making the right choice. Now, that sounds simple to say, but it's harder to execute on than, than you know, might be, might be self-evident when you look at things like time demands or anything else that are placed on an athlete. But first and foremost, is this helping students with their educational experience mm -hmm. in all of its guises? Secondly, we're, while we run college sports and oversee all of college sports, which is very entertaining and it's about the, that athletic performance, unlike other athletic organizations, we're still responsible for the growth and development of young men and women. We're in the educational business. So the second component is what's this, what do decisions mean for the health and well-being of student athletes? Uh, we want them to leave higher education healthier mentally and physically than when they came in. That's, that's our job as universities and colleges. So secondly, is this advancing uh, their, their health and well-being? And then, and then thirdly is just a fundamental value and notion of fairness. Are we treating everybody involved in this enterprise in a way that's fair, in particular the students? So is the, if you will, social contract between a student athlete and his or her college or university, is that a, is that a fair one? Is it, mm -hmm. Does it make sense for them? Does it make sense for the university? Are we, are we providing everybody with an opportunity for fair competition? What does that look like? Uh, and, and so I always try to balance decisions against that template of those three three organizational values plus your own personal values of integrity and honesty and fairness. Right, gotcha. And uh, I want to dive uh, deeper on a couple of those, health and opportunity. But before we uh, move on here, just want to let you know that this thing, again, is by being live streamed. If you want to tweet, it, uh, the hashtag is sport ideas. Um, we're also on Facebook uh, as well. So uh, health. Mark, what do you see the NCAA's role uh, as being in promoting the health of athletes and which athletes? Is it just college athletes? Is it athletes all the way down to the start of the pipeline? Um, talk to me about that. Yeah, well, first and foremost, it's, of course, our student athletes, the ones who are currently NCAA student athletes participating in our sport. Uh, so let me talk about that first sure. and then get to the, yep. the pipeline question because I think it's particularly germane to yep. what you're about here at the Institute. Uh, you know, when it comes to our athletes, the, for decades, the, the primary focus of the association has always been, let me, I'm sorry, let me step back a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that has to get clarified is the NCAA is an organization that includes 1,100 colleges and universities and all the decision making is made by those colleges and universities. My staff and I don't get to set policies or rules. Those universities set those policies and rules through a representative model that looks sometimes painfully like Congress. Um, but, but it is a representative model. Presidents and athletic directors and commissioners come together. We orchestrate, coordinate that, provide leadership and guidance to that process. But it's th those bodies that, that set the rules. The second piece that looks a little bit like being here in Washington, D.C., is it's a federated model. And what I mean by that is the universities and colleges themselves have the majority of responsibility for the conduct of college sport on their campuses. Mm -hmm. And then there's conferences that sit in between that are collections of, of schools, and then, there's a, and then there's a national body, the, the NCAA, that sits on top of that. Everybody has a different role to play in every element of, of sport depending on what the issue is. So the, for the most part, the execution on making sure that students are, are being treated health, in a healthy and, and uh, uh, successful manner in terms of their physical and mental development has, has resided at the campus level. And, and so the, the national body set up rules that said, okay, here's the things that you need to do generally, but then those always get executed at the, at the local level. When I got, got into uh, my current job about 
six years ago now, we, started, we also started a conversation with university presidents about should the, the national body also be more actively involved in, in understanding health issues, conducting research around health issues with the universities because that's where the, our great research enterprise in America is conducted, uh, pro actively promoting new rule changes around health and well-being, so being more aggressive and short about that. Uh, and so we now have uh, the largest concussion, co concussion study in history is being conducted right now, a joint study between the N NCA and DOD. DOD has interesting, interesting phenomena because their majority of their, their population is the same age as ours, right? 18 to 22 years of age, young recruits, a lot of the same health and welfare issues. So they've been a great partner. We both put in $15 million. We've got around 6,000 uh, people enrolled in the study now. So over time, we're going to have the first uh, immediate but also longitudinal study mm -hmm. where we can track mm -hmm. the impact, pardon the pun, of concussion on, on people's health. And, and, and we'd love that to be a 40-year study, a Framingham study of, of concussion, which the whole world would benefit from. What we're also trying to do on that front then is you can't wait 40 years before you say, oh, okay, now we know what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. It's as soon as you see evidence of anything, you try and translate that quickly into, into policy change. So while we don't have, medical science doesn't have great clarity about even the, the, the cause and effects of concussion, what their natural history is, everybody seems to react differently, mm -hmm. there's no biomedical markers for it, lots of, of uh, lack of clarity. Well, let's err on the side of safety then. So, for example, this year in, in football, we move, the, the, the rules move to everybody allowing just one full contact period during a week in practice. So you get one of those. Not It used to be unlimited. And then we move to two, and now we move down to one. The Ivy League has moved to zero. Yeah, what do you think about uh, that? Well, I think, it's a great, I, I think it's great they're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's unclear whether it'll have any positive impact mm -hmm. or potentially negative impacts, depending on how it affects game day play. Mm -hmm. But it's great that somebody's doing it. And so if in a season we see the, a, 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 some kind of indication of a reduction of concussion, well, then we can immediately say, yeah, yeah, let's all go to that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can translate it fast. Again, you know, we're in the education business, so uh, we, need to, we need to, if we have evidence that any sport is having an obvious um, impact on students' health that outweighs the, the, uh, the benefits of that participation, then we, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, a moral obligation to, in fact, say, well, let's, let's try and change this as best we can. Granted, we've got to run that through this deliberative representative body to make yeah. the rule changes. I can't wave a flag and make it happen. But, um, but everybody's been much more responsive. We've got lots of other issues, too, in the medical arena. Um, uh, that are related to the second part of what you're mm -hmm. talking about, and that's the impact of sport down into youth sport. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing, you've written about this, you might be the world's expert on it, uh, we, we're seeing in youth sport now earlier and earlier specialization in sport. Mm -hmm. So, and we have, we the NCAA have a role in, in probably propagating some of this that I assume you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But you know, you've got parents saying to their eight-year-old, you gotta practice and you gotta start with soccer now so you can get a college scholarship, right? And we know from surveys of our students mm -hmm. that they were hearing that when they were eight. And, it, and, and parents are often the culprits here in mm -hmm. encouraging the specialization. Uh, being Americans, we can turn anything into an industry. Being Americans, we can turn anything into a, into a manic passion. So we've got this whole system now that's, that has little boys, little girls specializing in a sport, let's say soccer, mm -hmm. from seven on, and they're showing up by the time they get to college, they are really, really, really good soccer players, and they're on their third ACL surgery. Yeah. Uh, half, this is a shocking statistic to me that I read, should have writ written it down, because so, I can't cite my source. I think it was the Wall Street Journal. Half of the Tommy John surgeries in America last year a surgery developed for aging major league pitchers, right? Half of them were done on high school baseball pitchers this year. Half of them. Uh, that's kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. And so we've got, we've got people that are convinced, parents, students, uh, people who work with youth sport, yeah. convinced that you've got to go through this, this grind mm -hmm. in order to be a D1, quote, D1 athlete or even a D3 athlete or whatever it is. And, and, 
and, and we need to get our coaches, our coaches are all saying, no, 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 we want multi-sport athletes. Mm -hmm. They're better athletes. They're not just, is it better for the kids? They're also better athletes. They're, mm -hmm. they, they've got more sport and athletic skill if they play two or three sports, and coaches really like that. Mm -hmm. But that word isn't getting communicated down to kids. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you think the colleges can play a role in doing that? I mean, you, I hope so. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. they're there in every state, and they're in a lot of communities. They have a lot of credibility. Mm -hmm. People are coming to their sport camps yeah. uh, each year. Um, yeah, I, it, you know, it hasn't been. I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I, in, in quite this way. But I don't think it's been seen as a responsibility of individual colleges and universities or the association. But now that we're now that we're making such great progress on our own health issues. Um, it, I think it's time for us to do just that. You've met Brian Hainline, our chief medical mm -hmm. officer. When I brought mm -hmm. Brian into the NCA, one of the things he first described was, "Look, this needs to, we we need to be the leaders of a uh, a whole sport health system from you know childhood and even beyond college to those of us that are aging athletes and and how can we help with that? Yeah. We can't lead it by ourselves, but we sure ought to be a part of it. Yeah, you know another implication of the chase for the athletic scholarship, which is. Uh, uh, really ramped up about 20, 25 years ago. I mean, you, the NCAA was giving out, I don't know, $500 million uh, maybe in aid in the early 90s, mid 90s, and now it's what, $2.7 billion in aid? Yeah, so uh, the, yeah, the total, the, the last data we have, which is probably 18 months old, is that, yeah, the total amount of scholarship support coming into higher education for athletes is two, was 27, approaching $2.8 billion. So it's a yeah. massive amount of money supporting students. Yep. That's a great thing. On the other hand, you know, it's created a, a, a lot of focus. A lot of craziness at craziness. the lower levels. Another implication is that, you know, when the parents sign their kids up for the travel teams and the private training and the this and the that, a, a lot of kids and a lot of families can't afford it. So, you know, um, we see a lot of kids who are just kind of stuck on the couch or they just don't have access to the system. Uh, they don't get into the pipeline. And, and you can see it in some of the statistics. I mean, I was looking at your uh, recent survey of athletes, college athletes, and how many of them came from first gen, you know, they're first generation students, meaning neither yes. parent went to college. And, you know, it's gone down pretty significantly, even in just four years, the percentage of kids has, has dropped. Um, how, how do you feel about that? And what is the role of the NCAA as it tries to improve its game academically or otherwise and still making room for the kids who don't have the resources, the families that don't have the mm -hmm. resources? Well, I think there's a lot of conflicting goals here again, right? Yeah. So you wind up back with values, which is the appropriate thing. But, you know, one of the things that we, we all want is for students who, kids, adults, who want to succeed and excel in sport for them to have the opportunity to become the best possible athlete that they can. I, I was just reading uh, this last weekend, for those of you that are college football fans, it was the kickoff of football and there's a number of true freshmen and redshirt freshman quarterbacks that look spectacular. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're coming into college now with so much more experience than a typical high school kid would have because they've been, in, they've been playing quarterback 12 months out of the year, mm -hmm. they've been going to summer camps, they've been going to an IMG academy, whatever they've been doing. So they're, they're much, much more mature as an athlete. And you look at that and say, well, that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. They're, just, they're getting better and better. You know, the, the t I'm always amazed that the time in the 100-yard dash continues to go down. You think, well, how is that possible? But, it, right. but people continue to get better in their sport. And we celebrate mm -hmm. that. I, I was thrilled at the performance of our women Olympians this year. They're getting better and better and better, and you, just, you cheer that. That's, so that's the part we all love. The part that's harder is, is that in order to be competitive in some of that environment, you do, you, if you do have access to that elite training, we'll call it, you can get better, and it, it does, in fact, um, block some people out from access to that. The part that I think is even more troublesome um, Walter and I were talking about it at, at, at lunch. He, he and I are about the same vintage. Grew up playing every, well, about the same. It was a good year. He's good aging year. gracefully is what he's saying. It was, yeah. it was great in Bordeaux, anyway. Was, <laughs> you know, about, you know, in New Orleans or Fife, Washington. But uh, so, so we grew up in an era where everybody played every sport, right? And you didn't have to be uh, the, the, the superstar athlete to get on a high school team. You didn't, it, was, it was something that everybody did. Again, part of what you're trying to focus on. And now you look at schools and, 
and the winnowing process to make the varsity team in basketball at a, at a large school or an elite prep school is, is really, really rigorous. Mm -hmm. Do we love watching those elite players play? Yeah, they're fabulous. They're so exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you watch an elite volleyball team. It's just an amazing thing. But I fear that it's indirectly or unintentionally encouraging the other kids to think, oh, I'm not supposed to be an athlete. Right, I, I'm not that good. I, I didn't go to the summer camps, so I quit playing soccer. And so instead, I'm going to play video games. I'm not picking on video games. I'm going to play video games, or I'm going to you know, do something else. I'm, I'm not going to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. And that's really regrettable because of all the benefit you get from being an athlete besides thinking if I'm not trying for a college scholarship, I shouldn't play. That's, that's, the, that's a very bad message to send. And, and we in the NCA have to... To try and communicate more effectively, the some of the realities of that. First of all, you you can do you, you don't have to be an elite athlete to to play ball at a D three school. Yeah, I ran the University of Washington, and nobody's playing on a University of Washington NCAA team unless they're a star athlete. Mm -hmm. That that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And I went to the University of Washington. I was not going to make it on a team. I played on every club sport that I could I could get into. And so we've got to also send the message that look, we want want we even expect you student at the UW or Maryland or pick a school you we want you to participate in sport and we got to find more and better ways to promote that kind of activity and again that's part of what you work on mm -hmm. I fear that it starts way before college though mm -hmm. that youngsters are now weaning themselves out oh I'm, I, I'm an eighth grader I, I'm an eight-year-old and I didn't make the travel squad oh okay I'm done mm -hmm. what an awful message mm -hmm. we got to figure out solutions to that. Yeah. Talk to me about your new academic standards that are coming in last month, right? Mm -hmm. you, you lifted the minimum GPA uh, that a kid has to have as he moves, matriculates from high school to college to what? Yes. 2.3, right? Yeah, from a 2.0 to a 2.3 uh, in a cluster of, of core courses that would be perceived of as generally around the country as a college prep curriculum. So it's not a 2.3 in you know, basket weaving, it's two, three in, in academic prep courses. Uh, the, the concern that led the, the uh, something called a Committee on Academic Performance at the time, a group of university mm -hmm. presidents and faculty members and ADs, mm -hmm. was they were looking at, this is only in Division One, but they were looking at the Division One students who were really struggling, mm -hmm. who, who were flunking out, who were unable to, unable to keep up with both the demands of being a Division I athlete and the demands of being a student athlete. And, and the vast majority of those who were unable to do it came in that, at that margin around the 2.0 grade point average. Uh, so so we, uh, four years ago now, we raised that, the committee raised it to a 2.3, uh, waited four years for it to trigger in so we could start communicating with freshmen in high school launched a really big communication program all over the country saying started a theme 2.3 or take a knee mm -hmm. uh, and trying to get kids ready saying all right you got to get ready you got ready here it comes here it comes so so there was virtually no one surprised at this change for this year mm -hmm. and then the other thing that we'd said was look if a university wants to offer a scholarship to a kid with a 2.0 the old mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. they can offer them aid they can give they can let them practice they can be a part of the team but they can't compete. So they became sort of an academic red shirt, if you will. And, and we're just now getting the data in, so we're not exactly sure what the impact has been. The first returns that I've seen showed a, a, a very modest number of students who did not hit that 2.3. Now what we don't know is, did more of them go to a community college and then try to come in that way? Uh, did we discourage? students from even applying to Division One, and they went to Division Three instead. Mm. Well, it'll take us six months or so, or maybe a little bit longer to know what the data really look like, yeah. but we're pretty confident that it will, it will um, allow those students to be successful. Yeah. Uh, you, you, it takes a lot to be a successful D1 athlete and a successful student. Every kid that plays basketball knows you gotta have a left hand as well as a right hand. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that they, they got math as well as English and that they've got it at a proficient level that they can be successful. Yeah, You know, when uh, the NCAA crunched the numbers the research team did a few years ago, uh, they looked at the academic profiles of uh, student-athletes entering D1 
institutions in 2009, 2010. Yeah. And at that time, it indicated that up to 15.6% of athletes might be required to serve uh, an academic redshirt year, with the most visible impacts in men's basketball, up to 43% of men's basketball players, yeah. and football, 35%. Um, given that a college degree, I mean, you guys know this, it's, it's central to your messaging, how valuable a college degree is. It, it, what, you know, people who have a bachelor's make 65% uh, you know, more money over the course of their lifetime than high school grads. Um, are the more restrictive entrance standards as well-meaning as they are, uh, and as, as, as based in the idea of, of creating real students and preparing them for life, are they being fair to kids from the lower socioeconomic homes? Are we going to lose a whole bunch of kids just because they went to a large high school and fell between the cracks and someone didn't know about the core courses and the and the 2.3 and and next thing you know they're a good basketball player and junior or senior year and they can't rehabilitate their academic uh, transcript on it does, does that concern you at all and do you yeah have any, you so we were we were deeply concerned about that in fact um, one of the things that we did when we saw that analysis so this was an analysis looking at uh, that cohort of students from that year uh, before, before this new standard was put in place. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is those data were driven by also an increase in SAT score. And, and so when we looked at the data, we went back to the Committee on Academic Performance, this group of members, and said, you know, you need to really rethink the SAT score because the SAT score measure, the, uh, there's a lot of people really critical of that, and, and so they, re they reduced that, and when and when we then went back and reevaluated the data, those numbers plummeted to where the impact was much, much, much lower. Mm -hmm. Then we were hopeful, because we've done this experiment before I was with the NCAA, when they set up the 2-0, uh, gosh, 10 years ago maybe, uh, then went out and told the world, there's going to be this 2-0, you've got to hit this. Uh, there was concern, same exact concern, but when students knew it was coming, they raised their performance. So the early data, again, this is early, mm -hmm. early data, seems to indicate that it's not had anywhere near the, the impact of, of uh, excluding students, but we're hopeful that it's had the opposite one and it's encouraged them to be better prepared. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll see in, again, a year or two or three when we can see what college uh, continuation looks like, especially among that cohort that's just marginally prepared. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic, but I'm deeply attentive to what you're describing. We've got to make sure that we're not, we're not cutting off that access. Mm -hmm. Again, we didn't cut off access. They could go. They just couldn't play in that first year. Yeah. So we'll see what, what um, colleges really do with it. Are there, are there legal implications? I mean, you know, you're obviously being tested in the courts with, with the Kessler case and Ed O'Bannon, and the argument from the NCAA, and correct me if I get any of this wrong exactly as you guys express it, is that, look, uh, you know, players, yeah, they're being paid. They're being paid with an education. And college provides opportunities to kids who ordinarily would not have them. Yeah. So if your numbers suggest that the opportunities are flowing disproportionately or just, you know, increasingly to kids who come from homes that they probably would have gone to college anyway, does that compromise? the NCAA in terms of its legal position in some of these cases? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to answer it as a, uh, from yeah. a legal position because the answer is for somebody else yeah, to decide. Yeah, yeah. But, but what I do know is that uh, one of the benchmarks of what college sport is about is, in fact, providing opportunities and providing access. And that a great many of the student athletes, and we know this from our surveys of them, we know this from all the data that's available, are, are students that either, and, and, and this is again the students responding to this, wouldn't have been in college at all or wouldn't have been at, at that selective an institution. And it was their athletic prowess that allowed them to gain access to that education and, and in particular access to that school. So, uh, and that can, that can occur at, at anywhere in the selectivity hierarchy. So, you know, there's, it, it, let's say it's at an Ivy League school. So. Uh, Football player may not have gotten access to the Ivy League where they're not a football player, but they are, and so they got to go to an Ivy League school. But the same is true at, at, at any university or college in the NCA structure, whether it's a Division Three or Division Two or Division One. 
So I, I'm enormously confident that and proud of the opportunities that are indeed being provided through, through college sports. Um, when, whenever you have any kind of academic standard, you know, the goal isn't to exclude people. The goal is to help them be ready to be successful. Mm -hmm. And when you have students that, ha that where there is this, the, the, this unfortunate low set of expectations and somebody comes in and you're saying, yeah, yeah, you're ready to go, come to us, mm -hmm. and they have no chance of success right. of doing both be a student and be an athlete, that, that's, that's not a privilege either. I and mean, that's a fundamental problem. So the goal isn't to exclude people. The goal is to get them to ready to understand that this is going to be a challenge and you need to pay attention while you're in high school to being a student. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people telling you all you need is a good jump shot, but you need to have school too. Mm -hmm. and, and we're confident that, that message is being delivered now. Mm -hmm. Are there reputational implications? I mean, you know, listen, you know, North Carolina, for instance, mm -hmm. one of the worst cases of academic fraud ever. I, I don't know what grade point average some of those kids came in with, but uh, I imagine some of them were not really prepared for college and probably should not have been at the University of North Carolina or wouldn't have gotten in with, with reg, you know, the standards that are applied to uh, most other students. As you lift the minimum to 2.3 and otherwise, do you think you end up minimizing the number of headache cases there are out there because you, 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 you have fewer mismatches between a kid uh, and a school, which could end up then, you know, in an NCAA investigation related to extra benefits or, or, or uh, academic fraud type of issues? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to comment on North Carolina. It's a, a case that everybody's read plenty about, and it's under NCAA investigation right now, which I think everybody's well aware of. Uh, but I think there's a couple issues here. So you, you, you worry about, I worry about, um, when you raise academic expectations, first of all, are you raising the stakes for academic fraud at the high school level? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, so, so everybody knows kids got to have two, three in these courses. What's going on there? The intent is pretty obvious. Make sure that you're a reasonable student and that you're quick, acad equipped academically to be successful. Um, it, it also then, that can also, of course, translate into uh, academic fraud at the collegiate level, and that's not new in any in any way in higher education, not just around athletics, but period. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're often asked, well, what's the NCAA's role in that? And if you go back to this notion that this is, you can't think about pro sports or anything like it. You've got to think more about higher ed. It's this federated model. First and foremost, academic integrity can only be managed by the university itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the NCAA or a conference can't go into the classroom and see whether or not English 101 is being taught with enough rigor. There's a, there's a professor in that room, there's a department head over that, there's a dean over that, there's a provost over that, there's a chancellor or president over that. There's plenty of people who have the responsibility to say, are we providing enough rigor in that class that it justifies the credit hour that we're delivering? Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there's a regional academic accrediting body that sits over that and says, you know, we're going to look at you. Then there's a conference and then we're clear up here. Uh, well, there is a good question, though. I mean, if all of the, if the accrediting bodies are comfortable with what's happening at the school and the trustees mm -hmm. are comfortable with what's happening at the school entrance stand who they're, who they're letting in and what's yeah. happening once they're on campus why should the NCAA even care about academics I mean that, well, I that's, think that's the argument that North Carolina is making is NCAA this isn't your role to to uh, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing yeah, yeah, yeah. that at all but. well I, again I don't want to discuss their case but uh, you, you know it's a it's a question that um, you philosophically you can legitimately ask, should the NCAA care whatsoever, the NCAA being the rest of the universities in America, right? Don't think about, you know, me and my staff sitting in an office, think about all the other schools because that's the NCAA. So if all the schools said, yeah, we don't really care about academic standards. If you think that person's good enough to come to your school, bring them in. If you want to give that person straight A's for four years, fine, we don't care. It's your business, not our business. We couldn't care less. Uh, well, back to remember one of those core values of fairness. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the fundamental principles is, is that this is about college students playing other college students. Mm -hmm. and, and if one school says, well, you know, we don't really care whether they're a real student or not. We just want to win football games. And, and, and we don't care if they go to class. We don't, we, they, we're just going to give them all A's because why not? Mm -hmm. Well, then the school over here that's trying to actually 
to take responsibility for education is going to say, well, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. And, and so what the members have tried to do with a core floor level of standards saying everybody's got to be at a 2-3, everybody's got to have progress toward degree, everybody's got to have this APR measure that we, that we measure before they can compete, they're trying to say, look, we want to make sure this is students playing students and that the students are real students and that if they want to be professional athletes, there's a whole professional sports system, they can go over there and play sport. But if you're going to be here, you're going to be a student and you're going to, you're going to play your sport in the context of higher ed. So when you look at it philosophically from that point of view, of course the, the members have to be involved. Yeah, well, this is terrific. I don't want to dominate the conversation. We have a lot of smart people in the room here. Uh, so we'd like to spend the next uh, 20, 25 minutes with uh, uh, Q&A. So anybody, any questions at all? Mark Hyman, by the way, thank you for yes. uh, making, uh, saying nice words about my work with uh, youth sport. Mark has written three books. I've written one. Uh, we have, we have, we have a, a fellow expert in the room here, but yeah, Mark. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer to this question is unknowable. So I'm oh, good. <laughs> uh, as we know, there, there's an enormous amount of effort and money spent on putting kids in a position to be recruited yes. as college athletes. And we're talking about college recruiting services and private coaching and all the rest. Do you think that the we'd have the same number of college athletes if all of that didn't exist? Yes. Is the population of students who are playing sports in college, has it changed as a result of this kind of industrial complex that's built up around youth sports? Or would the same kids be playing sports in college with or without that? Yeah, it, it is unknowable, so I'll speculate. Um, you know, I think they probably, the population probably wouldn't change that much, would be my guess. They wouldn't be as good athletes, probably, right? So you watch, I mean, it's a great question for Tom McMillan. So I watch high school kids play ball now, Tom, and I am astounded at how good they are. Astounded at how good they are. Uh, so a, a really good high school team today probably could have competed in an NCAA tournament 20 years ago. Um, so the quality of their play has gotten, I think, progressively better. And, and in sports where you've got objective measures of performance, track and field, for example, it's unequivocally better. They're just getting better in ath as athletes. So, so I don't think it would have changed the mix necessarily, but it might have changed the performance level. Whether that's a good or bad thing is a societal question. I, what I worry about is, um, is the creation of really unrealistic expectations because the number of opportunities for, let's just talk about males, the number of opportunities for male athletes has grown but hasn't grown dramatically. The number for women has exploded, which is a great thing. But the number of, of the, the expectations of families and, and therefore their sons and daughters, that they're going to get a Division I scholarship when the probability of that is very low, is, is a real challenge. And it's much worse around professional sport. So the data around professional aspirations is pretty shocking. So I don't know if you've seen our survey data, but when we survey men's basketball players, just men's basketball players, there's between five, 6,000 of those every year, Seven, about 75% of them say they're going to be a professional basketball player. Oh, what's the number? 2%? 2% are going to be professional basketball players. 75% say, respond to our surveys. Yes, I'm going to be a professional basketball player. Division two, almost half say I'm going to be a professional basketball player. Most shocking of all, 24% of division three basketball, men's basketball players say I'm going to be a professional basketball player. Zero are going to be a professional basketball player. Nay, not zero. 0 0.001 will be a division, will be a, a professional basketball player. So we've, one of the things that that enterprise that you've got has created is unrealistic expectations. We need to, and I don't know how to do this. I'd love your thoughts and advice, but we, the NCA and our member universities have to find a way to get more realistic expectations pushed into, um, into, the, the, into the youth sport arena. Gotcha. Next study for professional basketball. Hold on, maybe wait the... Uh... Study on professional basketball, did that include D League 
Europe and other foreign leagues do? With yeah, the yeah. Uh, well, I don't, we don't know. We don't, we, don't, we don't break it down. But even if you throw it all in, it, it adds up to maybe 6%. Okay. You know, but that includes, you know, 18 months in, you know, in Europe playing ball. It's, oh, okay, I was a professional basketball player. That's fine. But, but the, real access, the real question is, do you think, and we probably should reword this, do you think you're going to make a living as a professional basketball player? Right. Because, it, because it's subtle, right? When you were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, uh, what were you, I like was going to be grade, you said, second I'm, baseman at the Yankees. I had it nailed. Right. I well, you that. also said, very, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I, I'm going to be a university president at a very early age. I did, right? but we all want to dream. I didn't think right? that that was inconsistent with being second baseman at the Yankees. I could do one of the, because one's a summer job and one's a, you know. The Yankees is much more fun, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, all right. Yeah, Someone else? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey there. My name's Lucy Montgomery, and I'm actually a former NCAA athlete at Washington University in St. Louis. So What'd you play? Basketball. Great. Uh, so my question, really popular topic on campuses right now is sexual assault um, with a number of universities under Department of Education, Title IX violation investigations. Um, so I know that NCAA released a study or a handbook a couple years ago um, addressing sexual assault and interpersonal yeah. violence on campus. And earlier you were talking about kind of how do we um, manage our member institutions, how much, um, I guess, how, much, how do we give them their autonomy without, without um, kind of imposing our own ideas. So I'm just wondering if you can give us kind of some insights into the conversations that are happening at the NCAA right now. Um, a number of our UC cases, Florida State, Vanderbilt, Baylor, um, Stanford. What's the conversation in the NCAA now to make sure that the handbook that you guys released isn't just like a PDF that's living out there? Um, how are we encouraging our member institutions to make training an ongoing thing? Yeah. I think it's fair to say it's one of the most um, actively debated and discussed issues on the on the agenda right now among university presidents overall, and especially those in in the NCA governance structure. One of the first things I did, I, I came on board in in the fall of '10. The first symposium that that we sponsored when I got there was a symposium on exactly that issue, relationship, sexual violence and relationship violence. Um, that's part of what led to that handbook that you're talking about. It led to us working with the White House in the It's On Us campaign that we promulgated out across a lot of, a lot of campuses. And we had really, really great student athlete response and engagement around that. Uh, at the same time, though, it's really clear that the issue has not uh, improved in any meaningful way that we can tell. And, and so we, uh, a year and a half, I guess it's two years ago, this, this month, uh, the board looking at some of the um, perceptions, we didn't know what the reality of was, but looking at some of the perceptions that athletic departments were, were um, inappropriately engaged in adjudication issues and, and managing those disciplinary issues. Uh, my board, uh, on a day's notice, passed a resolution saying, look, let's be really clear. The expectation is that all athletic departments will have any issues, any student disciplinary issues in general, but around sexual assault in particular, or sexual misconduct in particular, those have got to be handled by the rest of the institution. The athletic department has to stay away from this. You can only, you can only cooperate in the process. You can't in any way become involved in it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very straightforward statement. We'd be happy to provide anybody that wants to see it. Uh, passed that unanimously, promulgated it, continued to, to talk about the issue. And then we, we had a series of very high profile issues happen yet again. Uh, over the past even just six months. So the, at the last meeting of our board uh, this year, just a couple of months ago, we agreed that they needed to create a, a uh, ad hoc committee of university leaders to, uh, to uh, be more aggressive on converting all of those policies into uh, serious rules with, with um, you know, the potential for for um, sanctions if you don't follow the, rule, the uh, pretty obvious rules around all of this. 
Uh, just yesterday, as it turns out, uh, the two co we had two co-chairs agree to, to chair that. that we, we'll announce them in the next day or two. University presidents that want to, that want to co-chair that task force. I was on the Hill this morning talking about exactly that issue. It's on everybody's mind. Uh, it is, as a former university president, it is pretty shocking when you, shocking to me personally, when you see universities not understand what that relationship should be and must be. And, and while, again, we've got this federated model, universities have to be the ones in charge of this, the membership right now is saying, well, look, if universities don't understand what their responsibility is here, then we're going to tell them. And then, and then they've got to they've follow that. It's, it's not an area where an athletic association would naturally go, but it's one of those handful of social issues where we all agree, I certainly agree, and I'm encouraging them to go in this direction. They just have to be, be engaged because it's way too much of a, of a national problem. It's not just athletes, of course, on campuses. It's a campus-wide problem. We get that. But to the extent we can have any positive impact, and to the extent we can get athletic departments to behave appropriately, um, that's where we need to be. And yet it's a, it's a dicey issue too. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago I reported out a story for ESPN about uh, male athletes who are now suing their universities because yeah, they, that's right. they believe that they have been falsely accused and these Title IX administrators aren't trained to do essentially criminal investigations uh, and they get bounced from the school and now it's on the yeah. record and they can't transfer. Uh, very complicated. It's very complicated. So, we, so we've had, for example, uh, some folks suggest, well, there ought to be a ban on uh, transfers of students who've been accused of sexual assault. Well, students immediately say, wait a minute, I've been accused of something and now my rights are being taken away? Okay, yeah, well, it needs to be that they were convicted of. Well, what does that mean? And so it's, it's a, it, you're quite right, Tom. It's a very difficult issue, but it's one that we've got to work hard on. Priority. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, you for for this symposium. It's it's been great. Um, my name is Jamal Atkins, Basketball Academy of Excellence in Southern Africa. My question is about extra benefits. Um, you know, I work with a lot of youth, uh, mostly men, but also young ladies, in Southern Africa that just don't have the material, the training materials, or clothing and things of that nature to get them back and forth to come to training. And I remember playing in the, in the 90s, playing sports. They, we always were told by our high schools, we can't give you these things when we went to big tournaments because that may make you ineligible if it's seen as an extra benefit. Um, do you know if there will be rules added, amended, to allow people to um, help young people coming from uh, developing countries so that they would have or closer to a level playing field that they get the opportunity to, uh, to, to gain the skills for them to come to universities. As I've helped young people come to universities here, it's a really hard conversation with the parents to say, you want to train my son four hours a day or three hours a day, twice a week, but what is he getting out of it? What if he never goes to school? You he could have been farming that entire time that you mm -hmm. had him in the gym you know, how does that help us in the long run as a family? Yeah, sure. Well, there's a bunch of complex issues in there, isn't there? So I want to make sure I understand. You're talking about a, a student, a high school student, let's yeah. say, in South Africa and what he or she could receive in support while they're studying in South Africa? Well, so I, I, I don't want to pretend like I have all the details of all the rules in place in my head, but... If, as, as long as it's not somebody who is a booster or affiliated with a specific school, there, there, there's no problem with a student athlete receiving support today. So if a charitable organization or, you know, we're close to Baltimore, Under Armour wants to send a bunch of jerseys to you or shoes to you, that's great, good for them. The only place it becomes of concern is if that is a, if, if a booster from, you know, pick a school, University of Washington, uh, decides that, that, that he's going to sponsor some student and has no relationship with him and is giving that student everything that they need and, and you know, paying rent or whatever, and then all of a sudden that student magically winds up at the University of Washington. That's where, where the, the other member schools say, wait a minute, that, that, that's not the kind of relationship that we want here. 
So if it's somebody who just wants to support young men and young women and wants to pro provide charitable support, whether it's an individual or an organization, and there's no recruitment relationship with it, that's all, that's all fine. I, I, I think the other, the other piece that you're raising, though, is kind of what we're talking about with American kids is how do you get some realistic expectations about their prospects of becoming a, a, a full scholarship student at a Division I school. I suspect that's a real challenge for you because unlike in the U.S., in the U.S., they're playing in club sports. They played against a bunch of other American kids. They can kind of figure out where they, where they belong in the hierarchy. For your students playing over there, it's probably harder to judge. And I, I'm sorry I don't have any magic wand to suggest there, but I can see where that's a real issue. And, and for a, 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 you know, a family that sees this young man or woman as an integral part of the economic success of that family, it, it, it's a big, it's a tough judgment call. We see it with, with poor kids in the U.S. too, who their family sees this young man, this young woman going on to professional sport as, you know, an, a, a, is a very positive thing to the extent even that they don't, they're not realistic about the prospects of that that young person becoming a professional athlete. Again, there's so many people that aspire to professional sport that don't have a really good sense of the market and where they really stack up and what they're really going to do. And so for 98% or more of our student athletes, the life changer is getting that college degree. Mm -hmm. That's the million dollar difference. I mean, literally the million dollar difference. And, and but too many of them get too fixated on uh, making it in the pros, so they leave school early, they go off and move away from their college degree. Now we've changed our rules a lot so that those kids can come back and finish, and most schools now it's in Division One are honoring. Somebody goes off, plays ball, quits school, says, geez, you know, I didn't work out, can I come home? And almost all the schools are saying, yeah, we'll honor your scholarship. Can't play basketball again, but come back and you be a student and we'll, and we'll cover your, your, your costs. And you know, that's a wonderful thing. We've had somewhere around 15,000, I think it might be 18,000 young men and women now come back and finish up their degrees having left, which is a really great thing. Uh, building on the, the extra benefit point, how do you see the NCAA's rules or philosophy evolving, if at all, as we move along, as the court cases get resolved? I mean, we, Rio, there were, there were NCAA athletes who yeah. made a lot of money from winning medals, and NCAA said, it's fine with us. That's cool. Does that signal a shift at all in the NCAA's approach to money that does not flow from boosters but flows from whatever, you know, governing bodies or perhaps even apparel manufacturers or uh, just someone who's not tied to the recruiting process with yeah. the school? So the, the, the model right now that, that um, is clear to describe, not always clear to implement, is that and it actually was, was worded beautifully in the O'Bannon case, in fact, by the, by the Ninth Circuit Court, was saying that, look, universities can and should be allowed, indeed they were saying must, be allowed to provide a student athlete. The, the, the NCA can't not allow, can't prohibit a school from providing a student athlete with anything that's legitimately tied to their educational needs, mm -hmm. right? So, so the, what they were saying is, yes, the NCAA does indeed have authority to say, no, you can't get paid for performance. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you can't get paid a salary. But the NCAA can't, and nor should it, say, look, you can't, we're not going to let you have a scholarship that covers all of your costs, legitimate costs of being a student. Now, the good news is the NCAA had already changed those rules a couple of years ago. Long, complicated fight that you and I have talked about mm -hmm. before to get the membership there. It was a place I certainly wanted them to go, and that's where we've gone now. So just to review the bidding on this a little bit, a uh, student athlete right now in Division I can, and, and typically at major institutions, is provided full cost tuition fees, room, board, book supplies, a miscellaneous expense allowance or a cost of living allowance, which runs, it varies from school to school, three to $6,000 is sort of the general range. Mm -hmm. They can provi be provided, and every university has. We, the NCA, distribute out about $100 million to all the member schools just for a, a pot of money that athletic departments have to cover whatever 
costs a student might need that are legitimate expenses. A kid breaks a computer or needs to fly home to a marriage or a funeral, doesn't have a winter coat, whatever it is. Uh, you know, I was having a great chat with Mike Shusevsky. He took his team up to, to New York to go to a Broadway play, to go to, the, to uh, Wall Street, to visit West Point, to do this whole a really nice four-day educational trip. Um, they didn't have clothes, so they bought them two pairs of slacks, a sport coat, a couple of shirts. All of that's perfectly legitimate, right. and they all got that, and that's a great thing. They take them on a foreign trip, you know, to play overseas. overseas all those, co all of that's mm -hmm. perfectly appropriate, mm -hmm. and and uh, that's now that's relatively new. So the the difference between what support a, a support a student athlete gets today versus five years ago, five short years ago, it's right. quite a bit different. Right. Uh, and that's a great thing, but it's all tied to what's the legitimate cost of being a student athlete here. Right. Uh, the, the, the Olympics is interesting because about 15 years ago, the Olympic Committee created Operation Gold Medal, I think yep. they call it. And, it, and it provides an Olympian, uh, regardless of whether they're, a student, whether they're a student athlete or not, with 25 grand for a gold, 15 for a silver, five for a bronze, I think, something like that. That's the magnitude of it. The NCA at that time, the members passed a rule that said, you know what, that's fine. Mm -hmm. A kid wins a gold medal for his or her country. Uh, they, can, they can take $25,000. They get to do it once in their academic career. It's an extraordinary thing. We got like five of those or 10 of those in any one year. Mm -hmm. Good for them. Mm -hmm. A complexity that happened this year mm -hmm. was that a college athlete, this is in the newspaper, so I'm not speaking out of school, a college athlete from uh, he's a swimmer at Texas, mm -hmm. is actually a citizen of Singapore, and Singapore gave him three quarters of a million dollars for winning a gold medal. <laughs> right? So, that, so, so to be perfectly honest, it's causing everybody to go, oh, well, that's not really what we were thinking about. So I don't know where the members will go on that. I mean, that's, uh, that's a little different than uh, 15 grand for the silver medal for, for you know, swimming for the U.S. of A. So uh, I think that's going to stimulate a a very interesting conversation. The nice thing about that model or that type of payment, it, it doesn't disrupt the NCAA's economic model itself. It's outside money that's being paid to someone. And uh, yeah, the question is whether it, that person is still an amateur, because if they if they competed in uh, South Africa uh, and been paid seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to play ball in South Africa, they would be declared a, a professional athlete and not eligible for NCAA play. Yeah, but that's I mean that's the fundamental problem. Does it matter anymore? Whether they well, are I think or not. it does. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the amateur model still is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, this woman in see. the back's been very patient. Yeah, me. sure. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm Sheila Walker. I work at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, oh, and I played Division One tennis a very, very long time ago. Um, you mentioned the Framingham study a bit earlier, which is the longest standing cardiovascular disease in men study. It's, uh, it's been a remarkable study. And uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one disease category in terms of expenditures in US healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. So this is coming through a different frame on chronic disease in sports. And if, if uh, the, the CDC stat on chronic disease as a category is that it accounts for about two thirds of the expenditures, healthcare expenditures in the US annually. And one thing that we know is one of the best uh, solutions to chronic disease is exercise. So if you could talk broadly about the NCAA's role or your thoughts about uh, sports and, and physical activity in general as a, as a public health issue and maybe extending down from the traditional age range of NCAA athletes into the eight-year-olds who didn't make the travel team you talked about earlier. Yeah. Well, I think it's even, it's even more um, important than even just physical health. As you well know, it's a lot to do with mental health, a lot to do with social development and, 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 and the development of soft skills. Um, I, I, I love to talk about uh, watching my kids, and many of you have experienced this, I'm sure, learn to play soccer, and it's this fascinating, fascinating process where little kids, four or five, whatever age they are, they come together and they play what I used, always used to call bunch ball, right? They all, they're all just, the ball's rolling around, they're all kicking the ball at each other, and you know, they just they have no concept of what this is. They just know they're supposed to kick the ball, and then, and then sometime, hopefully during that first season, 
uh, th this magic occurs where they all realize, oh, we're all supposed to, our guys are supposed to kick it that way. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the next magic is they realize, I have a job here. I'm supposed to stay in this area and kick it over to my friend and somebody's behind me and I need to trust that person behind me and I need to trust. And all of a sudden, teamwork occurs and, and you develop so many soft skills through uh, all that whole process, right? Resilient, uh, you know, all of them. I don't need to go through the list for this crowd, but so many things that, that are important to being successful in life that sport along with exercise and diet all, all contribute to and uh, it makes an enormous difference in, in a variety of outcomes. So again, we here to four, the association has focused predominantly on just our athletes, that's our job, uh, and just working with our universities and colleges and that tends to mean on elite athletes and helping them be successful in college, in life, and in their sport and compete at the highest levels. Uh, I, I think we're, we're I, my hope is that the membership is now ready, willing, and able to start to, to move in some other areas. My chief medical officer, when I hired him, he, as I mentioned, started to think about this all as a continuum of sport. He's, he's a neurologist, not a, not a cardiologist, but he, you know, he just thinks that way, and, and we're starting to ask all of the, I think, right questions about where are we helping and where are we inhibiting some of that development. I think the over-specialization really is a problem. Back to that eight-year-old that gives up on sport. What way can we help <coughs> encourage people to play sport, even if they're never going to play on a college team, let alone a Division I team? Uh, we've, I've, I've had meetings with the First Lady, and we've talked a lot with them about the White House. This White House has been great on that, as you know. And How can we be helpful? Um, we, we need to not drive everybody to the couch, uh, let alone to the console and you know but Pokemon Go get some outside so I guess it, you know so uh, so I don't have an answer for you but I do know that this is a societal issue it's, it's one that you know, it's this is Tom's mission in life but I think it's a societal issue that we as in America have got to be more attentive to we're becoming really really good spectators <laughs> but we need to be really really good participants well that's a great ending point so thank you Mark for the terrific sure. comments And uh, we will uh, we'll end the live stream now, but we will uh, we will you know, it'll be available on the, on the website later on. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. That was good. Appreciate it. it. Yeah. Pleasure. Oh. Good job. Have you? Did you meet Mark? Risa, this is. A